Hi, I'm Jeff Walters, and welcome to The Minutes. And thanks for listening today. It's great to have you along on The Minutes for the week of March the 25th, 2024. This is a City of Thunder Bay podcast. The Minutes takes a look at what happened at Thunder Bay City Council this past week. On this episode, we'll have a rundown of what happened at this week's City Council meeting and an interview with Leanne Chevrette, the Community Safety and Wellbeing Specialist. There is lots of discussion about community safety in Thunder Bay, and we'll dig a little deeper into it. But first, City Council approved its expenses for the past year, including committees of council and boards. The annual report shows the annual salary of each councillor, along with their expenses. Mayor Ken Boshtov had the highest salary and expenses, followed by councillors Shelby Chung and Brian Hamilton. Members of the TBATEL board were paid the most of all city boards, with remuneration being between $12,000 and $40,000. The total salary for the TBATEL board was $225,000, while the Synergy North board had a total salary of over $61,000. The expenses, though, of the Synergy North board were about $50,000 last year, while the TBATEL board expenses were about $8,500. Council approved some major changes to the parking bylaw. The changes include paid parking at the marina, increases to parking meter rates, increased hours of paid parking, and increases to parkade rates. The changes come into effect on June the 1st. Paid parking in the downtown cores will be six days per week from 7 a.m. until 9 p.m. Paid parking at the waterfront will also start at that time. Councillor Casey Atraney asked her council colleagues to look at increasing the municipal accommodation tax. The tax was originally introduced in 2018 at 4%, which was tapped onto the price of hotel rooms. The revenue was split between the city and the Community Economic Development Corporation, which funds tourism projects. In a memo to council, Atraney notes that other communities in Ontario charge between 3 and 8%. Administration will report back with options to increase the municipal accommodation tax in September. There were a number of votes and suggestions regarding Hillcourt Estates at Council on Monday night. Earlier this month, Council voted to take a report on the potential sale of Hillcourt Estates off of the Outstanding List. The Outstanding List is a group of reports administration is working on, as requested by Council. There were a number of heated debates and votes, along with amendments on Monday. Members of Council challenged the interpretation the City Court had on the procedural bylaw, as it relates to the Outstanding List. There was also a request to re-vote on the removal of Hillcourt Estates from the Outstanding List and to defer the decision until review could be completed by the Coordinating Committee. That's a committee of councillors and the Mayor. That request was defeated in a tie vote. Then, a request was made to defer the Hillcourt Estates report until March of 2026. That was also lost. Council did vote to have a report written on the future options for Hillcourt Estates, and that will come back in March of 2025. And that's a wrap as to what happened to Council this week. For more information on anything that happens at Council, please visit our website, thunderbay.ca slash council. Housing, community safety, crime prevention, and helping the vulnerable population is a priority for many in Thunder Bay. It is part of the city's strategic plan. On Monday night, Thunder Bay City Council received its annual update on the community safety and well-being plan. It's a provincially mandated document that lays out how Thunder Bay will be better prepared to serve everybody who lives here. Leanne Trevette is the Community Safety and Wellbeing Specialist in Thunder Bay. Leanne, thanks for coming in today. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming in. I'm glad that you could make it in today uh, on this snowy day today. Yes. So so let's start with the very basics. So this plan has been around uh, for a couple of years now, but what is a Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan? So the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan, as you mentioned in the intro, is a provincially mandated plan that all municipalities in Ontario have to develop and implement. Um, And it's really meant to address the uh, key risks to safety and well-being at a community level and then bring together community partners across sectors to collaboratively uh, work together to address those complex challenges. So, so essentially, it's, it's bringing people together to, to tackle the issues that we have. It really is. And the reality is that many of the challenges that we face as a community, uh, not unlike other communities, are very complex. 
And so we need solutions that are that bring together folks from across sectors that have diverse expertise to sort of tackle those those complex challenges. Now, now I mentioned a few things right off the top, which are, you know, big issues. So, you know, uh, homelessness, people who are vulnerable population, people with addictions. How does this plan address that? So there are six priority areas articulated in the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan, and those priority areas have been identified through uh, two years of community consultation and a really deep look at community-level data. And so those priority areas are the key, as I mentioned, the, the most significant challenges that our community faces. And so each of those priority areas, um, and I mentioned there are six, those priority areas have associated with them a, an action table that has sort of taken on the role of championing some of the work to address those, those priority areas. And so within the plan, we have identified some targeted outcomes And those action tables work collaboratively with a number of other community partners. Most of them are are actually um, um, multi-sectoral planning tables that include numerous partners from uh, the community. And they work together to help advance some projects and initiatives to try to address or to to reach those outcomes that are identified in the plan. You you mentioned the term action tables. What is an action table? So when we developed the plan and identified those priority areas, we recognized that we wanted um, groups to really focus on addressing those priority areas. And and let me take for an example, um, our first priority is anti-racism and anti-discrimination. And so what we did was we went out into the community and spoke with some, some different tables that are already doing that work. We wanted to leverage the experience and expertise and knowledge of, of existing uh, tables in our community. So we, in this particular example, we approached Diversity Thunder Bay, which is a longstanding community group that has been doing work to address uh, racism and discrimination and other forms of oppression in our community for many years. And so we asked them, as we did other planning tables that were already in existence, um, to champion specific priority areas that are they are already doing work um, towards or working towards. So that's how we kind of addressed it. We didn't want to create additional tables, but we wanted to leverage the expertise and knowledge already in our community um, and ask for their help and support to advance those goals. If we look at the plan, uh, just as, as you said, this is an annual plan. There's something that comes out of it every year. What were the, the biggest successes uh, in the past year? Well, I think some of the successes would include uh, um, successfully completing the five-year youth inclusion program. Um, That was a funded program through Public Safety Canada and CSWB, or Community Safety and Wellbeing, played an important role in first getting that funding to Thunder Bay to to support youth and families. Um, We did uh, an evaluation of the program and found really significant positive impacts for youth and and children and families in our community. And building on that, we've received some additional funding through Public Safety Canada to develop a youth gang prevention strategy. And that sort of builds on the success of the youth inclusion program and what we've learned and what we can improve and how we can do that work better in our community. So I think that was a really significant success. I think there were a number of other projects. There was a youth um, uh, a youth in solidarity against racism and discrimination. That program wrapped up, but did really great work bringing youth together to work towards addressing racism and discrimination and deepening sort of advocacy skills and leadership skills in, in some youth in the community. Uh, we also started the City Studio Project, um, which is a really exciting uh, way to kind of break down silos between the community, um, the city, and uh, academic institutions and provide youth with a really meaningful opportunity to engage in um, real life uh, work experience and, and work on important projects in the community. So there were a lot of really significant, um, I would say, um, positive outcomes through the plan. Um, but I would say also 
one of the most significant things that 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 I see happening is um, the relationships that people are building across sectors and recognizing how complex a lot of these issues and challenges are in our community and just the will of of so many service providers and organizations and citizens who want to come together and uh, you know, lend their hands and hearts to really improving our community. So I, I think that's a really important success story. Uh, and of course, always uh, the next question after successes is the challenges. What are the challenges that you, you think still remain? Yeah, um, not unlike many other communities, uh, there are significant challenges that, that um, people in our community face. And I think that um, many challenges that we face are... Um, as I, I use the term complex, it, it is really complex, but, you know, lots of people are still falling through the cracks, so to speak. Um, we, we continue to be very reactive in a lot of the issues that we deal with in our community, and, and I'm hoping that we can continue to push for more upstream invention in the realm of prevention and prevention approaches so that we can make sure that people have the services and supports and opportunities that they need to thrive. And and until we do that in a really fulsome way, we will continue to see uh, a lot of the challenges that um, folks in our community face, like housing and, and homelessness issues and mental health and substance misuse health, uh, or substance use health, I should say. And, um, and, you know, more people are experiencing poverty. People are really... Um, uh, you know, experiencing the impacts of um, COVID-19 and, and lots of economic challenges. So it makes it very difficult for people in our community. The, the last couple of things are that you, you mentioned, particularly poverty. Is, is that one of your focuses then for, for this year? Yeah, it is. So poverty reduction and financial empowerment is one of the priority areas within the community safety and well-being plan. And there is a lot of work being done to help people address the impacts or the challenges associated with poverty. We are advocating through the poverty reduction strategy for um, universal basic income, which we think would be really, uh, it, it could change the whole game for people. Um, I also, we also um, advocate for a living wage. There's a living wage campaign and we encourage employers and, and businesses in our community to, um, to pay folks a living wage, which is more so than a uh, minimum wage. It actually provides people enough money to have a higher quality of life. Um, and we also support a number of other um, like advocacy initiatives and, and poverty reduction initiatives through, through that table. So if you had to, if you met someone for the first time who'd never even heard of this before, they never heard of community safety and well-being, never mind to plan about it, uh, how would you kind of pitch it to them? What would you, would you, what would you say in the elevator from here to the, the 17th floor? Oh, 17 floors. Okay. I have a bit of time. Um, so I guess I would say that this is a, a community plan that brings together um, community partners who work across sectors, um, the community um, community members themselves, um, government, to work together to address some of the most challenging and significant um, issues that are faced in our community. And it really leverages the expertise of, of the people in our community. We can't do this without, without the community. And, and I think the way that we have positioned it is really meant to be not a city of Thunder Bay, like corporation plan, but it's really meant to be like owned by the community. And so, um, yeah, there are a lot of challenging issues that we face as a community. And as I say, it's not unlike other communities across the country and really around the world. Um, but this plan is really meant to focus our attention on a few key issues that we feel if we address, we will have the greatest impact on improving safety and well-being in our community. Leanne, really appreciate you coming in today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Take care. Leon Trevet, she is the Community Safety and Wellbeing Specialist in Thunder Bay, and she joined me here in the Minutes studio. A bit thanks for listening to the Minutes this week. Of course, if you want more information about City Council, agendas, or, visit, or minutes, visit thunderbay.ca slash council. If you want to listen to past episodes or maybe provide some feedback, visit thunderbay.ca slash the minutes. You can also find the minutes wherever you get your podcasts. So that includes Apple, Google, and Amazon podcasts, along with Spotify, plus our website as well. I'm Jeff Walters. Thanks for listening this week. We'll chat again in two weeks after the Easter holiday. 
make it a great day.